Matheson's novel is a mainstay of horror fiction. You can tell it because it gets remade into a movie every 20 years or so. The novel gives us much more than many other stories in this genre. Parts of it are scary, sure, but there's so much more depth in the psychology of the character and the rendering of the world that we can easily find our way into this book. In a major way, this book transformed pop culture. Look, zombies were around, but only in a very limited form. Vampires were cliché dukes and counts with black capes and Eastern European accents. Pretty trite, really. Matheson's novel updates the vampire in such a way that it actually informs the future of the zombie horde. This novel, 1954, inspired not only its own film knockoffs, but also George Romero's classic Night of the Living Dead, the first modern zombie thriller. I mean, yeah, zombie movies are a little bit older than that, but Romero's film sets the tone for all that followed. There would be no Night of the Living Dead without I Am Legend. Matheson's book also dwells on the psychology of isolation. Robert Neville lives in a burned-out hellscape, quarantined to his own house due to a global epidemic that has left him utterly isolated. Fiction! More than just a series of graphic scenes or scary sequences, we get a deep representation of what happens to a human mind when forced out from all social interaction. And it's heartbreaking. Just wait to get to the dog part, it'll kill you. I think to best understand what's going on here, we would do well to get some background in psychoanalytic theory. Psychoanalysis plays a large part in literary theory. Now, there's a major distinction we have to make. This isn't psychology. There's nothing clinical about it. We aren't talking about real people or, or real minds or anything. We're talking about literature, about art, about constructed and made up things. But in our analysis of these things, we can uncover some of the structures that make up real consciousness the stuff that populates and informs actual human minds. What I mean is when we apply a psychoanalytic framework to a novel, we're not looking at character as if they were some kind of case study. We're looking at a collective mind of the culture that produced and received the work of art. The big name in the background here is, of course, Sigmund Freud. Freud, you know, great big weirdo, but honestly, all of that mom love stuff is really misunderstood. For Freud, human self-identity emerges from the interaction of two forces. One, the primal bodily urges of the libido, fears, desires, the famous four Fs, feeding, fighting, fleeing, reproducing. The other force was the rational, organized requirements that arise when living in a society. Morality, law, duty, things I owe other people, things I must do to live at peace with my neighbors. This force Freud called the superego. The other he called the id, or the subconscious. These two forces don't always see eye to eye. They usually don't, in fact. The things the id wants, consumption, gratification, preservation, are restrained by the dictates of the superego. Societies can only function when there are shared expectations about safety or security, insured rights, protections. So I'm caught. I have to fulfill my instinctual desires. But for my own well-being, I also need to remain in good graces with the social order. As a result, Freud says, a third force appears. The self, I, ego. This is the conscious mind that wills and acts, and those wills and actions are designed to navigate between the desires of the id and the requirements of the superego. What's the best way that I can fulfill both these instincts as well as inhabit society? The mentally healthy I finds a way. Let's take an example. I saw a nature documentary one time, David Attenborough, talking about this hunter tribesman. This guy was amazing. The way he hunts was literally to outrun his prey. How does he do this? I mean, humans aren't that fast, especially compared to the animals we'd want to hunt. How does this work? So, dude's chasing after a gazelle, and the gazelle, of course, is way faster than the dude. But look, at some point, the gazelle gets overheated, has to rest in the shade for a bit. Not the human, though. He sweats and cools himself off as he's jogging along. So, as soon as the gazelle starts to catch her breath a little, here comes homie jogging along, and the gazelle's got to run again. And then the gazelle is getting thirsty and has to stop for a drink. But the dude, he gets to carry water around with him. He doesn't have to stop at all. So before the gazelle can get a rest, it's got to start running again. So the gazelle is faster than the human, but the hunter's physical body is made up so that he can keep moving when the gazelle gets tired out. So after days of chasing, the gazelle literally just falls over dead from exhaustion. The hunt is over. Man one, gazelle zero. Hunter grabs the gazelle, heads back home. Hunt's over. Look. That's just because of the hunter's body. I could totally outrun a gazelle. I mean, I couldn't outrun a gazelle, but like the human body can outrun a gazelle. We're made to do that. But, but look, I'm not going to go chasing after a gazelle. Even if I were in shape, I'm not gonna go chase after a gazelle. What would happen if I told my wife, well, I'll have to get some dinner and went for a jog for six days. Bro, go to the drive-through. 
I've got kids to raise. I can't disappear for a week at a time whenever I need a snack. I would lose my job. So even though I can go on a hunt like this, like my body could do it, and even if I may want to go on a hunt like this, like I've got some kind of primal urge to hunt or something, my role in society requires that I refuse that desire. But what happens to the desire then? Well, for the mentally healthy person, the I between the id hunter and the superego society, I would repress that desire. Now this is all a pretty trivial example. There are far more significant things I might need to repress than my urge to hunt gazelle. Traumas from past events could threaten to overwhelm my daily life. Fears, rational or irrational, could drive a wedge between me and my neighbors, or even my family. Unchecked desires could unravel the balance we need to strike to continue living peaceably with one another in society. In order to maintain a healthy mental life and a healthy society, I've got to do something else with those desires. This is Freud's theory of repression. By way of definition, repression is the act of transferring unwanted memories or desires from the conscious mind to the subconscious mind. Now I say act here, but this is really more of an involuntary thing. This is less a claim about what we should do and more a description of what is happening in our minds. This is just something brains do. Repressed thoughts are often traumatic early childhood memories or natural desires deemed socially unacceptable. Again, this could be anything from a basic biological desire to a more complex coping mechanism to manage major damaging events. Often repressed thoughts and desires resurface from the subconscious in dreams. For this reason, by analyzing dreams, we can start to get a window into the repressed desires that may be threatening to unravel that uneasy truce between id and superego. Psychoanalysis in practice often deals with accessing the subconscious through a kind of close reading of dreams. Repression is an integral part of human cognition. It's just what a healthy human mind does. It serves two purposes for us. First, it's a civilizing force and it's a defense mechanism. So first, a civilizing force. The adaptation of human beings to different socio-historical circumstances requires repression. This means that different social contexts will authorize some aspects of our repressed subconscious desires while requiring us to put a cap on others. Hence, societies shift on what's deemed acceptable behavior. What is potentially socially destructive in one context isn't necessarily socially destructive in another. So, for example, our running hunter chasing the gazelle, the move from hunter-gatherer agrarian societies requires a change in human behaviors. Or the change from nomadic to sedentary tribes requires a different lifestyle in which different things are acceptable. Running after the gazelle is both personally fulfilling and socially necessary in a tribe of hunters, but staying still to raise crops is far more advantageous for a society of farmers. The formation of civil societies is based on the repression of non-civilized, or pre-civilized desires and behaviors. Now, civil society here, I mean any group of humans living together for the mutual betterment of all. This includes the formation of laws or duties or other social expectations that produce the social good. Second, as a defense mechanism, painful memories are repressed to protect the ego, the conscious mind, the self, or I, from the destructive demands of the instincts. Trauma, especially trauma suffered at a young age, is automatically transferred away from waking thoughts to avoid fixation, obsession, or other self-destructive behaviors. Well, let's have a look at an example. You guys know Phineas and Ferb? This episode was called Monster from the Id. So Candace has lost a present she got from Jeremy, this, this boy she has a crush on, and wants to recreate it before he finds out. But she can't remember what it looks like, so, so the gang goes on a journey through Candace's subconscious to retrieve the info. Okay, here it is. Session would make Freud annoyed, but don't be paranoid. We're going deep into your mind. We're going deep into your mind. Were you traumatized by squirrels or a little girl with curls? Do you fear the number seven? Does a zebra call you Kevin? We're going deep. Into your mind. Here we are, Candace. Amazing. Now look, sure, this is a silly kids show, but there's a lot of stuff in here. 
Candace is pulled into this dangerous part of her mind through a mirror, a reflection of herself that is not her true self, but an inverted image of herself, an imposter. Once there, she finds a past trauma represented by a bunch of squirrels in her pants. There's a zebra that calls her Kevin. At the deepest part of her mind, a wild animal, often prey for predators, misreads her identity. The number seven, why is six afraid of seven? Because seven, eight, nine is a stupid joke, but she's afraid of being consumed, eaten, swallowed up. The monster beneath her bed, an archetype representing the deepest unacknowledged fears of the subconscious. But it turns out it's just her under the bed. And all this, what she's really afraid of is herself in some way. A fear of boldly bred, things growing on something else. Not exactly like a parasite, but one living organism using the body of another as a host. If you don't get it already, here's the kicker. A giant floating baby head. Look, Candace is afraid of getting knocked up. Remember, all this started because she's trying to make Jeremy believe she hasn't lost something. Jeremy, the boy she has a crush on, who turns out to be creepy old sex-crazed Freud in disguise. She's got squirrels in her pants, and there's something threatening deep inside her, but she's really scared of making a baby. And why shouldn't she be? 14-year-old girl with her first boyfriend, but a baby would certainly be socially or personally upsetting to the social order. So she's got to repress all those feelings and desires even though they're completely natural, in order to appease the social order. Oh, okay, so repression is normal, it's healthy. But once those desires are pushed down, what happens to them? I'll keep all my emotions right here, and then one day I'll die. For a healthy psychology, there needs to be a release, a return of the repressed. So how does this happen? Well, two ways. The first process is called displacement. As emotions associated with repressed fears or desires resurface in dreams, they are transferred into seemingly trivial things that begin to take on extraordinary significance until those symbols essentially take over the dream. Here's Freud. Displacement is the principal means used in dream distortion in which dream thoughts must submit. When the waking mind recalls the dream, it becomes fixated on one particular aspect. This object is therefore associated with the repressed desires now appearing in a new form. I mean, this happens all the time, right? I had a dream last night where I was flying through the air, and then I traveled back in time, and I was running through the forest, and there was a pumpkin laying on the ground, and then Darth Vader was chasing me, but I jumped down this massive elevator shaft and got away, and then I built a castle, but there was no bathroom in it, and when I woke up, I said, I just had the weirdest dream about a pumpkin. Wait, what? What about, what about all that other stuff? Why did I think the pumpkin was the most important part of all of that? Tell me about the pumpkin, Dr. Freud says. And I'll have to say something about, like, when I was a kid. I went out on Halloween and smashed somebody's jack-o'-lantern. And when my dad found out, like, he wasn't mad, like, like I thought he would be, but he got really, really sad. And then he told me about when he was a kid, he went to jail for doing something stupid just by hanging out with the wrong group of guys. And it almost ruined his entire life. And he was, like, so dang sad. I felt so guilty. I never felt so guilty in my entire life. And then Freud is like, aha, the pumpkin represents your relationship with your father. This means the pumpkin is acting as an image that represents all my emotions about my dad and our relationship that I've repressed. What's happening here is called condensation. Multiple libidinal thoughts are compressed into a single image called a symbol. This symbol is the manifestation of the return of the repressed through displacement. Second, repressed libidinal desires return through a process called substitute formation. In this process, the object of my fear or trauma disappears from my consciousness entirely. And all the feelings I have associated with that are moved on to a more acceptable substitute. So for Freud, this is the father. A figure of authority, dominance, control, a kind of mastery over the world that I desire but can't have. Freud writes, After repression, this impulse vanishes out of consciousness as an object for the libido. As a substitute for him, we find a corresponding situation, some animal, which is more or less suited to be an object of dread. Look, if everyone just went around being terrified of their fathers all the time, society would crumble. So I have to displace that fear into something totally cool to be afraid of, like, like Darth Vader in my dream. I, I mean, it's not as abstract as Ford makes it out here. It's not all fears of fathers or desires for mothers or that kind of stuff. There are all sorts of things we need to repress in order to function as human beings and maintain our place in society. The biggest one, maybe the universal one, is death. I'm sorry. You're not going to make it. Life is fatal. I've got it too. We're all slipping second by second closer to death. Sorry. But look, we just went around being afraid of dying all the time. We'd never get anything done. Society would crumble. No one would invest in the future or even in the present. So we've got to take that fear, push it out of mind, and replace it with a more appropriate object. So that's the mechanism for repression. But how does it work? Well, again, two ways. 
One, in a healthy psychology, repressed objects return through creative outlets, art, literature, dreams, where some of the censorship of the superego is less pronounced. Because artistic expression, just like a dream, is considered something created apart from reality, those repressed desires can resurface in displaced or substituted forms. Not death, but zombies. I can go watch a film or read a novel about zombies or vampires or plagues and draw all those emotions into a safe place where I can feel them, but at a distance. Instead of letting it get all bottled up inside of me, I'm able to purge them in this non-socially destructive way. But there are also ways repressed desires can return in less healthy ways. The first is called neurosis. In this scenario, something misfires in the substitute formation stage. Instead of the repressed object returning in a more socially constructive way, it returns in a way that's just as bad as the thing being repressed. The person fulfills the repressed desire through other equally destructive means. So look, I really want to chase that gazelle, man. In a normal, healthy situation, maybe I'll take up jogging as exercise or something. But with neurosis, my desire to chase the gazelle manifests as my desire to go steal cars. What a rush! But this is certainly going to be bad for me in the long run. Probably just as bad as making a week-long chase for the gazelle. Maybe even more so. So I'm afraid of death, right? But instead of watching zombie movies, I start growing monsters in my laboratory that then go on to terrorize all of Geneva. Or another way repression might go wrong is in perversion. Here a person recognizes they've repressed some desire. They see it for what it is. But instead of finding a socially acceptable substitute, they will instead embrace that desire that should be repressed. So Gazelle runs past my window, and I'm like, oh man, here we go. But I, I, sh I shouldn't. If I go run after that sucker, I'll lose my job, I'll anger my family. But dang, it's getting away, and I get up and I go after it. I see the thing, I know it will be bad for me, but I still go after it anyway. Okay, so how might we read Robert Neville's situation through this lens? Now remember, we're not interested in Robert Neville as a person. Robert Neville is not real. But this story and its impact on our culture does do the work of substitute formation and condensation. It highlights repression at a cultural level. When we read this text, we kind of have to read like perverts. What is the thing we're trying to push down? Or maybe more precisely, what is the thing that has been deemed socially unacceptable that we're being forced to ignore? Look, listen, all this stuff about the superego sounds nice and all. We all want to live in harmony, but there's a level of control here that smacks of cultural relativity. Whether or not something socially destructive is good or bad ultimately depends on whether or not that society is good or bad. An unjust society will repress justice. An unfree society will repress freedom. An unloving society will repress love. And frankly, in the unjust, unfree, unloving society, you ought to be a pervert. Freud's book he discusses all this in is called Civilization and its Discontents. And being discontent is totally an option. When we engage in the work of literature at this level, one of the things we're looking for is something of a roadmap for resistance. What should we be resisting? What is this text called up right here in front of us, right now, that we can now for the first time see clearly that we've been made to ignore? What is it that mid-century America found so terrifying and had to substitute for the living dead? What is it about mass culture that needs to revisit the same story every 20 years? We have our condensed symbols right in front of us. Ben Cortman and a slew of vampires, social isolation, global pandemics, Mass death, systemic failure on every level. The work of psychoanalysis is to address these symbols, to drag them into the light of consciousness and liberate us from the overreach of their control. But its job is also to awaken us to the systems and institutions that dictate the limits of socially acceptable behaviors and ideas. Just from your reading of the first third of this book, what is under critique? What is being repressed? 